This is a podcast from ComediansComedian.com. This is the Comedians Comedian Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Stuart Goldsmith. Today I'm talking to Jeremy Hardy uh, in a live podcast recorded at the Soho Theatre. Jeremy's on tour again later this year, so do check out his website. I'll give you some more details about that later on. A couple of things to push before we get stuck in. The Soho Run, the concluding five shows of uh, the 80-something date tour I will just uh, completed, including all the Edinburgh and Melbourne dates, uh, are the 30th of May to the 3rd of June. If you go to SohoTheatre.com, you too can use the, the secret discount code VERA, all capitals V-E-R-A, to get discounted tickets for those shows. I believe it's 7.30, but check on the website 30th of May, the 3rd of June at Soho Theatre. It's selling really well. It'd be amazing to sell it out. Uh, if you hear this in time and you're in Hemel Hempstead, you can come along to the tour show on the 26th of May. And, uh, of course, this the, the last Soho Theatre one of this run is with Joe Brand, which is, I, I think, I wouldn't say it's almost sold out, but it's well on the way to selling out, and uh, I'm, I'm confident that it will that's the 5th of june again at sohotheatre.com so uh, joe brand's an absolute legend of comedy can't wait to talk to her stay tuned if uh, tuning into things is a thing you do in podcast world after this episode at the very end uh, i am going to be replacing the post amble on this one occasion with the launch of a new exciting thing that may interest you so uh keep them peeled i keep you keep your eyes peeled what's the equivalent for your ears who knows let's find out later now for my conversation with Jeremy Hardy. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome to the stage someone who I have been watching for a very long time, someone who is uh, celebrating his fourth decade as a comedian. Would you please welcome, with warm applause, Jeremy Hardy. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Jeremy. Uh, Ger- I've just called you Jeremy. There we go. What a that's, fantastic start to the show. That's fine. You're obviously a huge fan, Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Well, I remember listening. I mean, you, we, we were talking about this before. You've been doing stand-up for four decades. Yeah. How much no, of the fourth I'm in one? my fourth decade. Uh, okay. That's just a, that's, that means I've just been doing it for more than 30. It sounds better. It sounds 30 years in a month. 34 <laughs> years. Okay. That's quite a long time. Yeah, that's enough to make one person go woo. That seems oh, yeah. reasonable. That's quite a long time. So, and, and to still be alive. Yeah. <laughs> that's your edge. Yeah. Yeah, there are no. people who've been doing it for longer, but they're mostly dead. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should start by talking about the early days of your career and how you put yourself together. Oh, I was together. young and pretty in those days. <laughs> how you put yourself together as a comedian. What, what do people most often get wrong about the birth of alternative comedy for which you were actually present? Oh, well, there's a narrative. I mean, bless. I mean, Stuart Lee, I'm very fond of Stuart. He's a brilliant comedian, but he likes to be the president of comedy. And he <laughs> he always talks about the early days of alternative comedy, and he doesn't know because he was still at Cheltenham Ladies College at that point. <laughs> um, uh, but, I mean, I, was, I, I came along a bit late. I mean, Stuart was not long after me, but I started beginning of 84, and it had already been up and running since May 79 was the opening of the Comedy Store. And I think the Earth Exchange, which is the first alternative, yeah, alternative comedy club in London, uh, had opened shortly before that. The Earth Exchange, you got paid in vegetarian food. Which is Arnold Brown called it pleasure free food. <laughs> and it was like rhubarb crumble with no sugar and wholemeal pastry and no rhubarb. I'm, and I am not salivating. Because people were rhubarb intolerant. And, um, <laughs> but uh, I came along a bit after. I started, so I'd, I'd missed the first sort of five years. Uh, I, was, I was still at college when it all started. Um, but it, what, I, mean, I did go, I did, the first thing I saw was, the first live stand-up I saw was the comic strip tour, which was, Alexi came on, he was the first live comic I saw, Alexi sells fantastic, bursting out of a big mod suit with a pork pie hat, screaming at the audience. And then Arnold Brown, for me, was the real star of that show, because there was Jenny and Dawn and Rick and Aid and all those people. But to see this sort of shuffling, awkward Jewish accountant, Arnold Brown, I'm Scottish and I'm Jewish, two racial stereotypes for the price of one. 
My father was a teetotaler, and I remember the shame on a Saturday night of him being thrown into pubs. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that, if you can be like that, I, I mean, that is fantastic. And Alexi was the opposite, screaming at the audience, you know, Pull shit, piss, cunt! Which I thought was good. And, um... <laughs> But, but, but the first comedy that I'd seen, stand-up... Well, growing up was Dave Allen, who was the, the first comic who didn't just do um, man in pub joke. And I like jokes. I like proper old old jokes. I like, I like silly jokes. There's a bloke in a job interview, and uh, he says, this is, this is an example of a joke. Um, <laughs> but I'm, sell- I'm telling it as an example, so, it, so you can analyse it rather than enjoy it. Um, <laughs> It's a bloke doing a job interview, and the bloke says to him, what do you think is one of your better qualities? And the guy says, well, um, I think I'm very confident in my opinions. And the interviewer says, well, I think that's a very good quality. And the guy says, I don't give a fuck what you think. <laughs> um, but, uh, and you could probably explain that joke to the audience, and they'd, say, <laughs> and they'd all say, I see. <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean, Dave Allen would, would, would chat, you know, and tell stories and anecdotes and talk about Catholicism and the church and religion and sex and all of those things, which most comics didn't do. And I, but I liked all the guys, not all of them. I didn't like the, the sort of overt racists, but I like comics who tell gags. I think that's a great skill. Uh, but then to see Richard Pryor live in concert at the cinema when I was 18, middle-class white kid who'd grown up in Surrey, going to the cinema and seeing Richard Pryor in the cin- uh, you know, for a two-hour film of stand-up, I thought, bloody Nora, I mean, this is amazing stuff. We, haven't, we had nothing like that. Did we you, were so behind. We were so behind in terms of comedy. Do you remember, did you see, did you go on your own to see that? Did you go with friends? I went with co- friends at college, yeah. And, we and all did just... it have the same effect on, on them as well? Oh, yeah, and there was a friend of mine, my, my, my friend Glennis, who was my first black friend, because I did grow up in Surrey. <laughs> And we did, I mean, Methodists were still being hunted for sport. So, um, and uh, Glennis, who's still a close friend today, uh, she was in fits. And there was lots of stuff that a black person would obviously appreciate much more, especially at a time when black people were still marginal in this country. And, and you know, at a university where there weren't many other black people, you know. And, uh, and people were quite overtly racist, actually, because it was still all right to be like that, even in a university setting. But um, no, I mean, to see something like that was, was amazing. But I didn't start scribbling down ideas. I, I always thought being uh, in comedy was about sketches, you know, footlights, Monty Python, then uh, Not the Nine O'Clock News. I always thought, that's what you do, it's sketches, or you're a poet like Roger McGough. I never thought I could be like a stand-up because we didn't have a tradition of people that just talk, you know, narrative, observational stuff. We didn't really have that. We had Victoria Wood, who's actually un- underplayed as a great... I think she was a fantastic comedian, and people... I've uh, never really given her. They've given her credit. Oh, she was a great writer. Her sketches were great, but she was a really, really good comic. And John Dowie, who she took under her wing, who is one of the great unsung heroes of alternative comedy, uh, who was on Factory Records um, and is still around, John. He's got a book coming out. But um, when I saw the first actual live comedy, I saw, as I say, was the comic strip tour. It would have been about 1980. And at that point, I thought, well, I'd, I'd quite like to maybe do this, but... But I, I, didn't, I didn't know there was any way that you could do it. I didn't know where you would do it or how it would happen until I moved to London and found out that there was this circuit. Do you remember in, in amongst those early gigs, I'm, something I'm, I'm struggling to phrase because it only just occurred to me, I spoke to Norman Lovett years ago. My name's Norman Lovett. The number of times people have said, love it, I bet you do. I'd have six or seven pounds by now. <laughs> Norman... <laughs> Norman told me, and I, I, I hope you won't be offended by this, but I think I remember Norman telling me that in your early days... I copied him. You copied him? Yeah, I did, not consciously. I definitely did. I mean, uh, as an influence, it, Norman was definitely the biggest influence because I was very awkward and I was very... Um, I'm socially awkward anyway, which is why I'm not looking the audience in the eye. I do that passive-aggressive thing of looking slightly above the eye line so it looks like I'm looking at you, but actually looking at your hairline, which really freaks people out. Use that. But... Um, <laughs> But I, when I first thought I'll do an open spot, I'd never used a microphone before. I just didn't know what to do with it. And some friends of mine had a band in Lewisham, and I'd go down to their cellar and just practice standing with the microphone because I'd never done that. And I'm mean, even now, I'd, I'm holding a mic. I don't like holding a mic because I'll probably drop it or eat it. And so I always leave the mic in the stand. And that's just been a thing that I do. I've never, people have said, oh, no, you need to take it out and walk around. You want, it should be a walk around. I said, no, I don't want to walk around. It's tiring. And um, I just like the focus of, 
because I'm not I'm not at ease with myself. So a true projection of myself on stage is a man who's not at ease with himself, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but when I first saw Norman, I thought, well, I didn't consciously copy him, but it was such a great, I mean, Norman is exactly the same as he is on, I mean, Norman is a fucking amazing comedian. I, I went round Norman's house when I first got to know him and I'd say, you're right, Norman, I'd say, yeah, someone's been round, they've, they've been to the toilet and they've, they've rucked up all the carpet all around the bottom of the toilet. You know, like, it should be smooth so that the bits go round the side there and it's all right. I don't need this. <laughs> and I thought, is this a joke or is this Norman? And that is what I love about Norman. That's what I love about Kim Noble, who often performs here at the Soho Theatre, as, as I'm very fond of Kim, and he's a dear friend. And his life and his comedy are just the same thing. It was performance art, really, not comedy. But he is screamingly funny because it's him. It's visceral and it's genuine. And with Norman, is there's, you just don't know if he's joking with you or not. Sometimes he's just talking. And he'll go on stage and just talk, and after about... 20 minutes or saying, well, let's get this show on the road then. <laughs> but um, but he, I did find myself doing him because, uh, I mean, not in a, you know, not in prison type way. I mean, um, <laughs> being Norman, because A, it's very infectious and it's a very funny delivery, but also because I was frightened, deadpan is definitely the easiest thing to do if you're frightened. Either that or you do, because Alexi's quite a complex and awkward character. But he goes to the other, he does the opposite thing. You become, you become the, the big shouty bully that you wish you could be. Um, so I suppose it's like teaching, really. You've got to find something that works for your, for your body type and your, you know, there'd be no point me being trying to be the overbearing alpha male in the room, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> so I, I started out very, very deadpan uh, as a defense mechanism. And so that lent itself to being Norman, really. And I went on Saturday Live on the TV and um, I think it was Chris Difford rang Norman and said, Norman, Norman, you're, uh, you've got someone copying you on the TV. You need to check it out. Norman rang me, he's very upset. Jeremy, I'm, you're plagiarising me. I, I'm upset. But he's forgiven me now. But it was, it was I, had, I, I did, I did, I copied. I did, not consciously, it's just... But I try not to watch comedians because it's very... I find... I find people in you know uh, infectious and so yes. it's very because I also because I'm lower middle class I have sympathetic accent syndrome yes which I means can. you start I totally have that as well you start to and we had these cousins who were Dutch and it was painful because my mum <laughs> my mum had it and she'd say would you like some breakfast I say mum that you didn't just speak in their language you just did a funny voice when when they're in Holland they speak Dutch they don't speak English in a Dutch accent as though they were in a war film but um but yeah, so it's painful. If I'm in Belfast for a day, I'll start saying... Uh, I, uh, I was speaking to my partner on the phone, and I said, get you to bed now. I thought, oh, for fuck's <laughs> sake. She's not going to fall for that. She's, when, she's back in Streatham. When you, when you watched that Richard Pryor concert, yeah. which must be as far away from your real self as possible... Oh, you... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> When you first got an inkling that that was possible, and that did did you have an inkling at that time? No, that that could... only when I saw people go on stage in this country. Okay. When I saw Alexi and Arnold, and I wrote, I remember going to my bedroom in my house at university, and I wrote this. It's probably I saw in a bit of paper somewhere in the love, a bit of in this sort of angry ranty routine, which would have been preposterous because I was, you know, a sort of lower middle class. Surrey raised boy reading history and politics at Southampton University. So the idea of me going on stage to berate the audience with my life history and my experience. You know, you're talking about a guy who was raised in a brothel and was a cocaine addict, not me, Richard Pryor. <laughs> so hard to compete with that. But I, but when I, when I, I think, uh, I mean, I'm talking about Alexi actually, was at the, the time that I first sat and wrote stuff down. Um, but I, that was Alexi Sayo, who's a big shouty scouser, you know, with an interesting family background, raised by communists and an interesting background. And um, so I was never going to, that, that wasn't going to work. It wasn't until I could start to sort of think about how I would just go on and just be myself. And that was when I came to London and watched stand up and you saw this whole variety of people. 
The great myth is it was all very political and it really, really wasn't. People talked about politics in a slightly knowing way, but most of it was actually taking the piss out of the left. You know, people like Alexei, you know, who was, who was you know, raised as a, as a Marxist-Leninist, and uh, people like Tony Allen, who was an anarchist, who was a, you know, a, a, a ranter at Hyde Park Corner. Um, lots of knowing jokes about the politics of London. And, and it, uh, it was probably quite niche at that point, the circuit. It was very much came out of fringe theatre. So people who would go and see Brad plays would then go to a room of a pub and see Alexi Sale or Tony Allen. So, uh, but, but most stuff, by the time I started, it was jugglers. Uh, there was a bloke called, what was his name? Bernie Bennett, who did a high wire act on a stage, stage no bigger than this. You'd turn up with all this equipment, 20 minutes with a high wire and a unicycle. There were poets, there were people doing musical comedy, there were people with serious mental health issues. Um, and. You know, there would be people who'd make ice sculptures and, yes, and, I remember and all about sorts that. of stuff. And but people, there's this myth that all you had to do was was say something rude about Mrs. Thatcher, and the whole audience would fall about. You'd get massive laughs. You got no laughs. You got funding, but you got no laughs. <laughs> Although ironically, I did get funding from Margaret Thatcher because. She brought in a scheme called the Enterprise Allowance Scheme. Mm. And what that meant was you could sign off the dole and you'd get 40 quid as opposed to 21 quid uh, to set up a small business. And Harry Enfield did that and I did that. And, uh, and I think it's gone rather better for Harry than it has for me. <laughs> but I think he's probably signed off of it now. I don't think he still takes the 40 quid. But I still do. But... Um, but yeah, all that happened was that once a month you had to meet your advisor and they'd say, how's it going then? And you'd say, yeah, I'm doing my comedy. And they'd say, you want to watch that Gary Wilmot? He's doing well. But, it, but really, it was quite clever because it was a way of getting you off the dole because otherwise we'd have all just stayed on the dole. So do you remember, and I, I'm, I might come back to that because I think there is something happening in comedy at the moment whereby uh, the, the massive profusion of new acts on the circuit, the fact that the circuit's kind of contracting there are more free entry gigs. Uh, I was talking with the comedian oh. Matt Green about this last night and about how... So I just poured water all over the electrics. This is an episode of Holby City about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think there is something happening in comedy. Because we don't have an equivalent of, of that enterprise allowance scheme at the moment, I think it prejudices, it, it benefits... The way that comedy is set up benefits people who are independently wealthy or who yeah. can live at their parents' I place. I think it's really, really hard for comics now. I mean... I mean, that, the 40 quid a week off of the um, Enterprise Allowance Scheme was great, but, uh, and the dole before that. But in all honesty, I mean, my first gig was at the Banana Cabaret in Ballam, and I did, I did characters there, not very good, but I did characters. What characters did you I do? I used to do uh, a Blue Peter presenter making a nuclear fallout shelter with dolls and teddies <laughs> out of an old Weetabix packet. And I, th what was the other one I did? I can't remember. Oh, I think I did an appeal on behalf of boring people, which wasn't very good. It was just I'd, I'd wear a bow tie and say, hello, I'm doing an appeal. You know that voice that people used to do for boring people, <laughs> um, which is basically my voice. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but um, yeah, so I did the Blue Peter thing a bit as an open spot. And, but and, and was that out of a... a a sort of fear of doing your own thing? Did that predate Probably, your own but it's, I think I'd done it at university because I did a review thing at university, which is all sketches. Because as I say, that was what you sort of thought... Com respectable comedy, middle-class, university-based comedy was sketches. You know, it was... Even people like, you know, Rowan Atkinson were, were very much in... You know, he would do a stand-up show with just himself, but it was all characters, it was all sketch-driven. There was no Rowan Atkinson on stage. Um... So, uh, you know, the, we hadn't really, you know, the, establishing the idea of, of comics talking, comedians being people who just talk, was very, very new in this country. That was a real revolution that alternative comedy was. It really grew out of punk. I mean, you've got punk and then you've got the ranting poets like Johnny Clark, Seething Wells, and then you've got stand-up comedy. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the real breakthrough was just that people don't have to tell a gag about a man going into a pub. Although I, you know, as I say, I do like those jokes, but um, I've lost my train of thought now. I remember getting off the tube. The rest of it's a blank. Now. <laughs> <laughs> 
what a joy to talk to Jeremy Hardy. I have been a fan of his for 25 years or more. And um, I have that weird situation talking to him where you see his head and you're like, well, he's, I'm conversing. <laughs> I'm conversing with someone who, like, in listening back to some of his shows, I realise there's, there's, there's things that are common currency of language between me and my brother, which uh, were Jeremy Hardy jokes from 20, 25 years ago. And then you hear that voice and go, oh, I've, I've got to speak now because I'm not listening to something. Uh, I'm actually part of a conversation with the great man. What a lovely man. He's well up for doing more. He said that he was uh, frustrated that uh, we had as, as little time as we did. So there's plenty more conversation to have there. I hope to bring you part two of that at another date. Um, do remember, you can look at Jeremy. I, I'm going to guess it's jeremyhardy.com, but let's face it, you don't need web addresses. Just Google Jeremy Hardy tour. Um, and you can find out his tour tickets. He's got a few shows coming up uh, in the next few weeks. And then I think he takes a break and he's back later on in the year. But he really has to be seen live. He's such a wonderful, wonderful comedian. Um, thank you very much to Jeremy for coming along and Amanda Emery, who helped me set that up, and everyone at Soho Theatre. More from Jeremy in a second. A um, couple of things. As I mentioned at the top, my own Soho run, the final five shows of Compared to What? The final five, 30th of May to the 3rd of June at Soho Theatre. Um, you can also come and see me in Hemel Hempstead, Warwick Arts Centre in Coventry. Yes, it is in Coventry. It's not in Warwick. The title is a lie. Or indeed, uh, Hemel Hempstead. So go to comedianscomedian.com forward slash tour for those final dates. And this is almost the last, I guess this is the penultimate pod on which I'll be pushing them. I've had so much fun on the tour. It's been amazing. Uh, I, a little bit more chat on that later. But remember, come back to me. Keep listening at the end of this episode, at the end of this conversation with Jeremy, because I'm going to be launching something quite interesting. And uh, it's a crazy experiment that I think, as far as I can tell, has never been done or attempted before. It's a, it's a one-off show at Edinburgh, but you're involved and it's all a bit strange. And I haven't written this down, so I'm going to improvise my way through the launch of a thing shortly. If you'd care to donate, if you'd care to join people who, are, who have been donating to the show, then you can do that. Comedianscomedian.com forward slash donate. You can subscribe with a monthly payment of, might I suggest, £2. You can do more or less if you like. Uh, or a one-off donation of the equivalent of a nice bottle of wine. Uh, and I'm getting married soon. Let's make it a nice case of 12 bottles of wine or whatever equivalent. Um, listen, you, you're the only people that give me money to do the podcast. Podcast. I think in 200 and something episodes, I've only advertised on five of them. Uh, and the rest of the time, it is all down to you. So if you're enjoying it, if it's making a difference to your life, to the way you live your life, the way you do your work, uh, and you would like to become part of the small, if I'm honest, small, but niche uh, subdivision of podcast listeners who support it financially, then please do that. And of course, do share it around the place if you, uh, if you don't or aren't able uh, to, to, uh, to support it financially. You can certainly support it with a five-star review on iTunes, especially if you live in a country that isn't Britain, because everyone has their own iTunes pages. Um, chuck a five-star review up there. That helps me get visible and, uh, and share episodes with your friends. So I will launch the proper thing proper later on. Let's finish off this conversation with Jeremy Hardy. Do you remember the first joke that you wrote that felt like your own voice? Oh, OK. Well, um, yeah, I did. By February, beginning of 84, I did a thing that Ivor Denbina organised, which, which was a thing where we got paid. I got 11 quid. A um, bunch of us. He... he um, Always paid around that amount of money. Either. Still does, apparently. Still does, yeah. apparently. But um, no, Ivor's a great fella. But um, I don't know, there's about 10 of us. There was Arthur Smith, Kevin McAleer, one of my all time favourite comics, Kevin. Kevin's, Kevin's opening line was, I'm Kevin McAleer, as the name suggests. <laughs> And it's a, it, you have to know that people of Tyrone, to, that is absolutely, I mean, there's no, there's no artifice there. That is, <laughs> Tyrone people are like, he'd do stuff like, uh, in those days, we used to make our own entertainment by watching the television. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think I was very stiff then. There was no, it was just survival. I was just... I had some put downs. I wrote a lot of put downs because I'd seen, I'd been to the comedy store, I'd been to other clubs, I knew people would heckle, so I'd written some put downs, but I was very stiff. Do you remember what, do you remember a put down that you um, wrote? One of my early, well, I'd just shout, if someone heckled me, I'd say, um, I'm sorry, Nigel, it's over, can't you accept that? <laughs> um, 
But, um, and I mean, there were all the standard ones that I didn't like doing. People would say, oh, that's what happens when cousins marry or sit yes. back in your seat, someone will plug it in. But I never liked those. Sure. Uh, because... And was, was heckling as much of a, an issue as you feared it was? I remember when I started, I'm sure I, I held back a few years from um, fear of being heckled. Only it actually in happens. some places. I mean, the, the tunnel in Greenwich, they were terrifying. They were all Malcolm Hardy's friends and he'd met most of them in prison. <laughs> And that meant they were all highly educated. I mean, they all had degrees in sociology. And they would look at you and, and, and they, would, they would see you moving toward a punchline and think, well, this is when we echo. This is at, he's at his most vulnerable during a pause, you see. You see, he's like all the expectation in his eyes. He thinks, I'm going to get a big laugh here. So he's off guard. He's all confident. Now we strike. <laughs> And I remember one night at the comedy store, I was holding onto the mic stand. I was just holding the mic stand. You know, you fiddle a bit with the stand. And, he, and the bloke shouted, let go of the mic stand. You're displaying your insecurity. <laughs> I've heard that's a famous heckle now. I didn't know that was, that yeah. was you. They, yeah, 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 oh, yeah. man, that's I mean, one of the were, most devastating yeah. heckles. I mean, they were terrifying. So uh, about, I almost want to cut that out of the show. I don't want that heckle to be out there. I don't want, to, I I don't want people I to know. know you can say that. I know, but they were brilliant hecklers. Um, but it was sp and I went down one night as a punter I just thought oh, I shall go as a civilian I was off duty because the terrible thing that happens when you're a young comic is you're working every weekend and then you get a weekend off by chance and you've already lost all your friends because because you don't go out on a weekend anymore and then there's nothing to do so you end up going and hanging out in the bar at a comedy club and that's that way you end up uh, severely mentally ill um, but I, um, I I went along as a punter to the tunnel and I heckled somebody. I heckled. I thought that was going to be the end. Of it, so I went no, along no, before it was I like, knew it. I, I it was like you know this is what happened when the the Nazis occupied the Channel Islands. You know, and very quickly, you start dobbing people in to the Gestapo. I I um. What was your heckle? Who did you heckle? Uh, I daren't say it now because she's somebody I'm quite friendly with. and I think she's forgotten. <laughs> but, um, there can't be that many women of she, doing the she tunnel did club this, in the eighties. She did this act about existentialism. And, and I shouted, show us your psyche. Um, and then I felt really ashamed. But you do, it's that, it's, that's the power of the mob. It's like, you, you know, I saw the pitchforks. I saw the burning torches and I joined in. And I just thought, thank God, it's not me who's being bullied. It's that terrible thing of when you're a small person that's been picked on. It's like, thank God it's not me. Yes. You know, so, uh, Just yeah. Just on the subject of heckling, I, I heckled a show at the Secret Welsh Comedy Festival last weekend. Nish Kumar was comparing. He'd established there was an actuary in the audience. Five minutes later, he asked someone what they did. They said, I'm an actuary. And at the back of the room, I shouted, what are the odds? And it's the funniest thing I've ever said. <laughs> And, and I tell you what, when you're out there in the darkness, it's easier. It's easier to think of funny stuff. There are good hecklers. I mean, there was the, there was the case, you know, um, Kirk Douglas's other son, not Michael, there's another son who's a comic. Mm -hmm. And he came over to the comedy store and he was struggling. This is probably apocryphal. He was struggling really badly. And he just said, look, you guys should treat me with some respect. I'm Kirk Douglas's son. And someone at the back shouted, no, I'm Kirk Douglas's son. <laughs> I, I think that is apocryphal because the person who made it up recently told me it was them that made it up. Oh, who made but, it up? Well, I can it's a good bug it if I can remember one. now. Um, I, but there was a Star Trek sketch someone was doing at Edinburgh and someone shouted, it's comedy, Jim, but not as we know it. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Tony Allen, dear Tony Allen, who was a pioneer in many ways of stand-up comedy, was sitting in the front row. Um, I think I might even have been there. These guys called the New York Stand-Ups came to... Um, Edinburgh in about 84. Because the thing is, American comics knew what they were doing and could come over here and be new but experienced, whereas everybody here that was new was incompetent. More interesting, <laughs> but obviously when you start, you haven't got a clue what you... Well, that was the case then. I think comedians are fully formed now because they've grown up watching Jack D and Eddie Izzard, whereas I grew up watching um, relatives die. Um, no, I, 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 I grew up, um, you know, in, in the 30s. Um, no, I mean, we didn't have, you know, we had, we had Dave Allen and Frankie Howard was, and Les Dawson. I mean, all brilliant comedians, but we didn't have that sort of observational, easy style where you, 
where you just chat about stuff or you can talk about politics and stuff. So um, whereas now I think people are fully formed. But I mean, it was very easy for people to come in from Australia or America and be brilliant and, and massively successful because they, were, they had that under their belt. They were experienced already. So we would always be in awe of the Americans when they'd come over and they'd just do their rubbish. Like, hey, guys, you know, you know this when you go out raining and water falls on your head? What is that? And everyone goes, wow, God, that's so confident and amazing. And, um, but this guy, and they all do that, because I hate crowd work, and I've got friends who do it, but I hate it. Leave the audience alone. They've paid. Don't ask them questions. Don't set up this bogus sense of intimacy, because they're basically paying your mortgage, just because that's how dirty it is. Just respect that they've paid and leave them the fuck alone. You know, and oh, what's your name? What are you doing? Oh, have you, you're, oh, you're punching above your, all that shit that people are. But, um, I know people do it well, but it's shit. Um, and you're with, the, you're with the kind of the Woody Allen school of thought of you don't improvise on stage. You no, just I want do. To I do the... sometimes. I do. And sometimes people shout things out. But, we, but because, I, because I look like a nice person who doesn't hate the audience but also isn't interested in what they have to say or what they do for a living, people sometimes chip in, but usually in a way that's helpful. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So they will shout out a suggestion or something that is a point of information. Because they are, you know, they're a bit like par- my gigs are a bit like meetings of the parish council. So somebody will say, "I move that we adjourn." About usually about four minutes in, um, and occasionally I get voted out of my own gigs um, and have to resign. But um, but no, I don't. I don't like. But anyway, my point is, Americans always do that. And uh, all that shit that people do. And um, so uh, these American comedians were on in Edinburgh, and one of them, Tony Allen, who's who's an gigantic man. I mean, t- I mean, in my world, most people are, but he's like seven foot twelve, and he was sitting in the front row with his sort of legs all folded up. And this American comic said, "Hey, buddy, what do you do?" And he said, "I'm a comedian. What do you do?" <laughs> and I thought that was well deserved. But I got a very good echo once. I was on at the. Um, Crown and Castle in Hackney, which is now part of the vast gentrification of Dalston. And uh, it's probably a, a, a pop-up wheatgrass juice bar now, <laughs> but it, it was a pub. And uh, I, had a, I, um, I had a joke, which I probably did in Norman Lovett's voice. I had this cardigan, and my joke was, I got this cardigan in return for sexual favours. I went to Boots on my brother's behalf. <laughs> Because in those days there was shame and stigma attached to buying contraceptives. So you see, that's the idea. I should explain this to the joke. <laughs> because it was very, very funny in 1984. Um, but the, the minute I said, I got this cardigan in return for sexual favours, a very old lady at the back said, Looks like it shrunk a bit. <laughs> and I thought, I, thought I, I, Let- I won't proceed with the joke now. <laughs> Let's talk about your your political jokes on stage. Oh, Did fuck, you s- do we have to? Well, why do you say that? Because once you're down as a political comedian, people think, oh, God, life is so hard. Do we really want to go and have the trade figures explained to us for two hours? <laughs> you know, and I mean, I talk about uh, this a lot with Mark Steele, because I think when you're down as a political comedian, it's sort of like... He's not a proper comedian. I turned up at a gig in... Do you, in, do you think... Yeah, do you think yeah, that? I think so, yeah, definitely. People think proper comedy is people doing stuff about, hey, aren't kids small? And don't kids, <laughs> don't kids say kid stuff? And you know what it's like when a thing is not quite as easy as you hoped it would be? What's that about? That's what people think real comedy is. Who but do you, when you say people, which people do you mean? I, I don't know. I, always... I, don't, I don't like people. I don't meet people. <laughs> Um, I before, try to keep them out of my life. Before, before I was a comic, I was a huge comedy fan, and I always regarded political comedy as proper comedy, to which I aspired but would never I be able to all do. I think because everything's valid, um, but I, I think the categorisation... I mean, I think it's a bit weird. To be honest, I know some great comedians who, who do stuff that I think, bloody hell, are you still doing stuff about aeroplanes? I mean, you know... That was that was a cliche when I started. Your airplane material—that was mm-hmm. your bloody—that was your real 
God, okay, it's a re- things are going really badly. I better do the airplane stuff. You know, it was a cliche in America. Because oh, it was so... Re- where do you think that originated from? It was so relatable. I think it, it was, was so... when airplanes were invented, people started, <laughs> you know, it was, you know, it was... Well, it's just like, you know, whatever, your breadsticks and your, and your inflatable thing above the thing and the announcement and the, and the slide and taking off your high heels and all that stuff. I mean... It, it it just it was a cliche. Dogs, cats, and, and I like my tea. I mean, I you know, there's always new jokes to make about dogs or cats or difference between men and women. But these things do become cliches. So when is somebody is doing? And I sometimes think, look, who are you? What? Yeah, that's fine, that stuff. But who are you? And then, but then equally, somebody might come and see me do. If I'm only doing twenty minutes at a benefit, I'll do all my left wing stuff, and they'll think, yeah, but who are you? And what do you wake up screaming about? And what happened in your childhood that made you into such a clearly damaged and troubled man? I do think that there's an element of comedy whereby what they, they're they looking at us, they're looking at you, thinking, what have you got that's worth complaining about? Do you know what, what I mean? in terms of being quite privileged? No, 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 I don't know. I don't mean that. We, we, absolutely, we can talk about that. But um, I think that, that when you say what an audience looks at a comic and thinks... What do you wake up screaming about in the middle of the night? I think that's, I, I feel that as well. If I see someone, and obviously there are the Harry Hills of the world where you just think, brilliant joke writer. Oh, God, great, I love Harry. You know, Harry Hill t- makes me laugh. I mean, I love Harry Hill. Absolutely, absolutely. So he's one of my all time favourites. So there's definitely, there's not everyone has to do the soul bearing comedy. No. But I know what you mean. If you see someone do kind of bland observation that doesn't seem to have their heart and soul in it, yeah. then it, it's frustrating. Yeah, or just if they're just doing sort of one gag after another. I mean, I like jokes, and I like jokes. I like daft pub jokes. I, you know, I'm very, I'm very keen on on jokes like that. Um, but but you do want to know who the person is. And the trouble is now that there is so much comedy and so much trying to be different, and so much trying to find a you know a USP or something that you can put on a poster or something you can take to Edinburgh or something that will get you a good review that we're all sort of thinking, oh, God, oh, the next time someone dies in my life, then that's my next show, you know. And, and there is that danger that we're all looking for. And, and then maybe maybe I could be quite moving in my next show. Maybe I could say something quite poignant. So there is a danger that you're just cannibalising everything, you know. And, and, and I talk about death and, 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 and um, quite a lot. I mean, I've always talked quite a lot about death. But it, as you get older, it, it becomes much more relevant than, than, than birth, for example. I was, so. I was listening to some of your material from something like 2005, and you were talking about feeling old. Yeah. And I thought, you've, is that a particular preoccupation? Yeah, because the thing is, I was like old? Spencer Tracy or Dolly the Sheep. I was born old. I was cloned from an 85-year-old man. Um, I was what, born old. So uh, what, what when I you... see all these comics do their, hey, <laughs> I'm just, I've just hit 40, but I think, oh, fuck off. <laughs> I did that material when I was 30. <laughs> you know. um, what, 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 is, what is it about you? You say you were born old. What does that actually mean? Is that, that preoccupation of yours... Is that connected with a, a fear of being old or feeling old? No, I think What's I've about? always felt old. I think I'm sort of probably getting younger as I get older in some ways um, in terms of, well, when, you f- when your face starts to fall apart, you have to start buying slightly nicer clothes. I mean, this is me, this is me having made an effort, I should point out <laughs> to the people here. But because um, when I was younger, I just wore jumble cell clothes all the time, which was quite cute in a sort of, you know, winsome looking 22 year old but uh, now I would just look homeless, you know. <laughs> so, um, but but no, I've always been. I've always felt old. I've never. I never felt like a young person, even when I when I was one. Um, so were you always like you talked about kind of wearing a cardigan on stage and and kind of your your position? Yeah, I can't do that now. I look like Rigsby and Rising Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> but you're almost like your your position as a comic voice on a bill of whichever other ten comedians. You have always had a sort of a a kind of a, a cosy armchair feel that has concealed the sort of anger of your material. Well, I think. The people say that, so perhaps it's true. I think sometimes it you can sneak stuff past people if you're sort of quite dis- equally. You can. Bat, batter them over the head with it. I mean, I think it's very funny when you beat someone over the head with something like Frankie Boyle does. I mean, Frankie is sort of like in the Alexi tradition of being so aggressive and so um, belligerent that 
any heckler is going to be macerated and people are going to try and heckle because they feel like, oh, I should have a go. And then they're going to get destroyed. Um, but also Frankie's got a real passion. I mean, the Brit that, I mean, what the great thing about Frankie is, you know, that everything, everything that he does comes from a really dark place of self-hatred. So, and some of the, I mean, some of the stuff Frankie does, I don't like, uh, I, w I would say this to his face. Uh, and I think he's a fantastic comedian. I don't like jokes about rape because I think people have been raped and why make them revisit that needlessly, you know, I mean, but, but, um, and also there's a danger of people thinking, well, thank God the shackles of, you know, the shackles of political correctness are off and we can talk about whatever we like, you know, uh, but, um, Frankie is a fantastic comedian and he's and you can see the real Frankie when he's talking about things like Palestine and injustice and poverty and then you see like how much he really cares about things and you see there's a man with a lot of love because he cares about humanity otherwise he wouldn't be doing it. he wouldn't be he wouldn't care he wouldn't care enough to talk about these things if he didn't love humanity um, but that um, that's very effective because he's just this sort of bulletproof, belligerent Glaswegian. Um, but I think what I do works quite well because I'm a sort of Zeta male kind of tiny wizened figure who, um, who says some things that are quite pertinent, possibly or radical, but in a, in a, in a way that feels comfortable because I mean, I was, I went to see Frankie here the other night and I thought, this is absolutely brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. And if you went on stage in five minutes time at the Glasgow Empire or the Apollo, you would destroy the audience, which I probably couldn't. But likewise, you probably couldn't come to some very nice little art centre in Cambridgeshire and, and entertain my audience because they you just you just ruin their lives. I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> I think I heard in one of your conversations with Mark Steele on the radio that you uh, you referred to the Triangle of Death, and I remember Maidenhead oh, yeah. being one of the towns. Maidenhead, Reading, and High Wycombe. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell me about that and what your who your audience are, and whether I you are satisfied know. with who your audience. I don't are. know to be honest, because I've I've started asking people how many have seen me before, and usually most haven't. Possibly most have heard me on the radio. But I, I always think it's odd because I think I've been going for 30, 34 years. So partly I'm pleased that there are new people and partly I'm thinking, well, what's happened to all the people that have... I mean, ex you'd think that exponentially, assuming all those people kept coming and then had children and grandchildren, I should be playing to millions by now. <laughs> but, um, but what you realise is that people don't keep on just coming to see you forever, especially because there are millions of other comedians now. I mean, someone, I was doing this gig in Cambridge the other night and someone said, oh, gosh, she's, uh, she said, um, oh, God, I've seen you before. I must have seen you three times. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, once every 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I don't know who my audience are. It varies. It varies around the country. I mean, in, in, a, in a sort of city with a big traditional trade union movement and a traditional left, like Sheffield or Manchester or Liverpool or or Norwich, actually, or Bristol, I will get, you know, a more left-wing audience, a more trade union, public sector workers, um, uh, trade unionists, I'll get that audience, teachers, nurses, and, and manual labourers who are politically... Do we still have manual labourers in this country? <laughs> They're very good with their hands, you know, but um, <laughs> or get people, but people who read about politics and care about politics are involved in the left. If I'm in, I don't know, the wilds of, of, of Devon, I mean, it, it varies. I, th I suppose you've got, you've got to entertain whoever's there. I mean, I'm conscious that, that Brexit has, I mean, not everyone who voted for Brexit is, is a sort of racist sociopath. And if you just go on stage and sort of go into a sort of liberal metropolitan, you know, sort of meltdown about how beastly it all is and how ghastly it is that people that, that people don't understand how good the fishing quotas are, <laughs> then then people are going to think, well, fuck you, you know. So you've got to you've got to you've got to treat the audience as either you berate them. You know, I mean, Bridget Christie does this very well. She's her show about 
Brexit is brilliant. You either berate, and Stuart's brilliant. You either berate the audience in the sort of, I don't care what you think, you or do what Frankie does, which is I hate you anyway. Or you think, well, all right, you're, you know, you might be. I have people in the audience probably who are Tories, and I try not to hate them. Because <laughs> I've got friends who are Tories. I hate the Conservative Party. I think it's an absolutely egregious thing. And I think it will, it does nothing but harm. But people, individual people who support it are not horrible. They're probably they're good neighbours. Conversely, I know lots of people on, on the left who I agree with totally and are complete fuck-ups as people. <laughs> um, but so I try not to, I try not to judge the audience and I try, I try to be broad. It's difficult. I mean, we were talking before uh, because the audience might imagine that we'd never met until the second I walked on. Like it used to be when Cilla Black was on TV, when she'd have a guest on and they'd hug as though they'd never met before. Uh, but we had had a five minute chat. But um, I always feel slightly guilty shaking my guest's hand. I know, when I it walk feels on, a bit. As weird. if we haven't just chatted yeah, for five minutes. But we didn't chat for very long, but I can't even remember what I said now. Um, what was I talking uh, about? You were talking about not hating Tories, and earlier we were talking about Trump and Macron. No, no, no. We were talking about who's in the audience. Oh, yes, sorry. I don't know what I was saying. Is anyone in the audience? Can anyone in the audience remember? That? Um, what was I saying? No, just I don't. I don't know who's in, and I try not to sort of make people feel shit about themselves. I mean, I I am quite unpleasant. My partner thinks I'm really unpleasant on stage because I, you know, I really. I mean, I tear into pe- I tear into people for strange. Th- I t- I hate people who do marathons, but for no, I hate everyone who does marathons. Even friends that do marathons, I hate that. I hate them for that. Um, Why I hate you... people who use grammar badly. I hate rudeness. I think rudeness is probably worse than fascism. But um... Where did these think, to the extent to which these are real hatreds and not simply a comic contrivance that you can put your foot down on in a, in a, in a room? Well, that, that, yeah, there is that, there is that, there is that thing of... Um, you know, obviously there's the sort of comic bluster of pretending to hate things and be frustrated by things that you don't really, really hate. And that, but that's part of your, people talk about comic persona. I don't think I have a comic persona. I mean, this isn't really a persona that you'd bother to create, is it? In all honesty, but um, I mean, the, uh, Inception fans will be really excited by the fact that that joke was a perfect example of someone employing a comic persona um, to make a point about why they wouldn't need to employ a comic persona. Okay, but what, what I mean, I, listen back to that. It was fucking brilliant. Okay, um, but but um, I think when you're on stage, you're sort of in the. You're you're the comedian. You try. I don't know. You're you're that bit of you. The same way that we've got different things that we do in life. Like if we're talking to parents or we're a doctor or, uh, but especially if you're a sort of self-loathing chameleon like I am, where you you just desperately want to kind of fit in. Um, but also, I think everybody in life has different. Like you don't sort of like when you go and see the doctor. You, you don't sort of. You don't go, oh, Doctor, I've got a terrible pain up me shitter. Could you have a look at me, Jaxie? Perhaps stick a couple of fingers up there. It's all, you know, you, you think, it's the doctor, I'm worried that I might need my prostate exam. So you, know, you we've all got different ways that we present ourselves. And uh, on stage is just one of them, you know. So, and you can be, you can sort of, I, I, if you're, most comedians are, are quite, a mess and I think it's the one time in your life when you're going to be able to hold court what I, what I've, what troubles me now is when you meet comedians that you think there's nothing wrong with you you'd have been fine why the hell are you doing stand up <laughs> I talked to Jack Deere about this a lot and I heard him on Desert Island Discs and he said the first time he went to the comedy store he said I realised what was wrong with me I was a comedian <laughs> and now you meet somebody who's just like could 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 just be in a boy band or like <laughs> be an oil executive and I think why are you why are you doing stand-up comedy so you know? why are you doing stand-up comedy what's wrong know. with you I don't know I don't know but so I don't have to face myself I don't know because because I couldn't probably I am ashamed of it I mean I think I'd rather have done something important or worthwhile but that didn't happen I just ended up doing um stand-up I mean I think I probably would have been a really good linguist I think I'd have been a good foreign correspondent and would those things have felt more worthwhile 
Yeah, and the thing is that then when you were funny, people would have said, uh, God, he's a funny guy. Whereas when you're a comedian, your friends never say that. They say, all right, you're not on stage now. Yeah. <laughs> you know. why, um, why? Or they say, oh, he's not very funny in real life, is he? <laughs> all he talks about is self-loathing and the economy. Where does the self-loathing come from, for you as opposed to any other comic, um, given that the majority of us aren't not, damaged, as you say? It's not real self-loathing as such. I think to be really self-loathing, you've got to be utterly self-obsessed. I mean, I think... Uh, <laughs> Is it, are you saying that you're, you don't care enough about yourself to loathe yourself yeah, properly? Yeah, <laughs> kind of, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'm sufficiently interesting to be um, to be really full of self hatred. Um, it, it is interesting that that element to which you knock yourself for your for your not being interesting, for your safe background, the you know the middle class origin. You you are always, I think, either you're being sort of tactically careful to position yourself. To, to admit to everyone, to throw yourself on our mercy that, oh, you've got an awfully safe, privileged life. No, I, think- I haven't. I mean, the thing is, I'm not, I mean, I wasn't even that posh. I was, I was born in a, on a council estate, well, in a hospital, but I was, when um, <laughs> we lived on a council estate, it was once I'd been called Jeremy, we had to move. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, my dad was a scientist, but we're not very well paid. And, and the fact we got more middle class as uh, my, my older sisters are more common. And they've got sort of, they've got sort of Aldershot accents, and I'm and I'm much more, I'm much more RP. Um, but um, we weren't we weren't that well off. I mean, yeah, we were middle class. My parents were were not from privileged backgrounds, but they were very bright, and they weren't they did they hadn't got they hadn't gone to university, but they were very bright. And we always had newspapers and books, and um, and talked about politics. And my parents loved comedy, so we had comedy records in the house. They didn't have any pop records, but they had comedy records. So I was very, I was very blessed in that way. So, I mean, it was very, very comfortable. Not, I mean, it's weird this, because now, I mean, poor people have more stuff than we had, but they have much more deprived lives. I mean, we didn't, you know, the telephone was was in the house and it was you didn't have a telephone that you could walk around and take pictures of yourself on it was i remember the phone but i remember when we didn't have a phone and and you know and, and my dad had a telephone voice because it was so exciting it was a, hello fine affordable phone i need because you know the phone was a huge thing you know and you'd have a piece of paper by the phone so you could write down in case anyone rang because it would be the king ringing to say that we were at war with germany or something <laughs> um but but Materially, we had bupkis, but but culturally and in ourselves, we were more relaxed because you didn't need stuff because you know poverty is relative. So I, you know, I I, I know young people who've got smartphones and expect you know hundred quid trainers, but they're vastly deprived because they live in a world in which those things are so prized. You know that if you haven't got, you know, if you haven't got hundred quid trainers, you're fucked in a lot of parts of our society. You know, so. Materially, I wouldn't say we were rich, but in, but it was at a time when you didn't have to, you know, you didn't have to have material things to be comfortable. But I think on, I think the point I'm trying to make is that on stage you adopt a position of a, admitting your privileged, no, maybe not your privileged upbringing, but being painfully middle class. Yes, you know, that's, and I that's think it would be. A, it's, a it's partly started as a device because I thought. I mean, my initial jokes were things like, you know, I grew up in a village in Surrey and and if any kids went barefoot, it's because their parents had the, the, the pavements carpeted with Wilton. I can't even remember it now. It was 34 years ago. Put Wilton carpet on the pavements and things like that. So my jokes were about not being working class because I thought it would be preposterous to pretend that I was working class or because the, the explanation of the explanation you've given me about your background in, in respect to class is too much of a mouthful to transmit to well it's that but also set. the thing is it's a question of what's funny some accents are funny and some aren't you know I mean uh Geordie accents are funny Scottish accents are funny Liverpool like Brummy accents are funny West Country accents are funny um the accent that isn't funny is the sort of non-specific home counties, lower middle class kind of drawl. I mean, you, now there are posh comedians. There were posh comedians then, but they would never have spoken in their posh voice. That would have been uncool. So, uh, But now you can go on stage and basically admit that you're hugely privileged and rich and have no need to do stand-up comedy at all because you've got a private income and, and own Canada. Um, <laughs> and the audience finds that hilarious, whereas you would have been beaten to death in the street if you'd done that 
30 years ago. But I mean, I, I think it, yeah, when you start, you're much more self-conscious about about trying. I remember Patrick Marber, who's now a very successful playwright, and he used to be an earnest young stand-up, but now he sort of wanders around wearing a hat with a huge scarf carrying a tiny dog in the palm of his hand. Um, but he... Um, he did a terrible act called Dross Bros, and I toured with him. And he was a nice fellow, I liked him, but he took me out to lunch and he said he wanted, to, wanted tips on how to get into stand-up. I know, we don't, I'd only been going for a year. And he said, so Jeremy, what persona should I do? I said, I, I don't know, I don't know, Patrick. And he said, well, there are four, aren't there? I said, what? He said, well, there are four. And he explained them, it was like the, um, the bombastic, the self deprecate or whatever they were. I said, I don't know, Patrick, just go on and be yourself. And he said, no, no, the great thing about you, Jeremy, is when you go on stage, the audience knows the product that's on sale. And I thought, I can never be your friend. <laughs> um, but I think over the years, I like to think that the, the artifice has stripped away. I mean, I, I, um, I, I think that uh, it's, I, I just, I do just go on and talk, but it's a question of having an attitude of mind, I think. You go on and stage and talk with enough confidence or enough, I don't know what it is. You just communicate something to the audience, some sort of, and it's partly being confident and it's partly being empathetic in a way that a teacher would, where you're saying, look, I'm on your side, I want you to have a good time, but on the other hand, I don't, I'm not going to fucking bend over backwards. Um, you're going to have to like me and go with this, and if you don't, fine, I'm not going to hate you, but I'm also not going to apologise. So you just, I don't know, you just acquire a sort of ease with yourself, which you might as well have, because as you get older, you think, well, I'm stuck with this now. I'm not going to become somebody else. Um, I think when you're younger, you sort of always hope that you will somehow. If you could be somebody else, I don't mean a specific person, but a, a type that is other than what you have, what, what would that type be? What is it that you... One of the X-Men, something like that. <laughs> Which one? Yeah. Someone who could freeze people or um, shoot, shoot tiny splinters out of my ears into people's faces. I don't know, something like that. As a it's not much to ask, is it? <laughs> I'm going to persist in asking the question. But from the point of view of a, a different type of comedy. Oh, comedy. Um, when, you, when you were a young comic wishing you could be someone else. Oh, OK. I'd probably like to have been somebody who could leap around. And be very expressive and very loud. And did you ever try that? Did no. you ever do one gig no. and just bounced around? <laughs> no, I, there's a little bit of dance in my stand-up at the moment. I won't, I, won't, I, won't, um, I won't give the game away, but I just thought I'd do a little bit of dance. Someone on the, uh, the Facebook group of this podcast said that I should ask you about your wonderful singing voice, which could move an angel to tears, but I know enough to know that yeah. that is an in-joke and I'm not going to let myself get tripped up by it. Well, we can talk about that if you want. You don't want to talk about that? <laughs> I, do a, I do a radio program called <laughs> I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue on which I have to sing. And uh, one of the things we do is one song to the tune of another. And the other week I was at the Albert Hall for some strange benefit for Parkinson's disease. And it was, a, it was a huge lineup. Pete Townsend, he's on day release. Um, <laughs> and um, I don't know why he was there. It must have been research. But anyway, um, but, uh, I had to sing Teenage Kicks to the tune of Jerusalem with a full orchestra at the Royal Albert Hall. <laughs> and the orchestra were really confused. <laughs> but I do occasionally go into tune. But I think is I, because I can't tell if I'm in tune or not, so I can tell if other people are in tune, um, but uh, and I can tune a piano. I can't tune a piano, but I'm, my sight is failing. So I'll get to the point where I can. But um, <laughs> but uh, occasion, I, occasionally, I, I can't tell if I'm in tune or not. So sometimes I do go into tune, especially if I'm in character. Like you know, like people who stutter. If they're singing, they don't stutter. So if I do a voice, if I do like Bob Dylan or somebody, then I don't. I don't. I go into tune. Apparently, it's interesting, isn't it? So we've moved seamlessly from comedy to the art of singing. <laughs> I'm going to come back to comedy. One briefly, thing I would like really... to say, though, because I was saying about how easy it was when I started, is that definitely it was. Because my point was, I did an open spot at the Banana Cabaret, and a month later they said, "Come back in four weeks." And in, and and I'd rung the night before. I said, "Can I do an open spot?" They said, "Come tomorrow." 
Four weeks later, I had a paid gig with 30 quid in my pocket. And this was 1984, which was more, and that was, the doll was 21 quid. So 30 quid in cash. And you started, oh, fuck, now I'm going to go to prison for benefit fraud. <laughs> but, um, but um, you know, you got, you got cash. And you, if you did enough, and the thing was that there weren't many of us, so there were plenty of gigs. And you could get, and I think it's really hard for comics now because they wait months for an open spot. And, uh, you know, and they get, every time they go to Edinburgh, and they end up owing money. I mean, that's ridiculous. If you're going to end up owing money, don't go. Don't do gigs where you end up having to pay somebody back. What the, I mean, that's, that's madness. But I mean, I think it's really hard for new comics now, really hard. Before we wrap up. I Are we wrapping to, up? Yeah, nearly. We're nearly quite, done. We're nearly done. It's flown now, by. Um, I was just getting going. <laughs> we could keep going in the dressing room. Um, sounded odd. <laughs> sounded odd. We <laughs> might. We might wrestle in front of an open fire. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to talk to you about specifically about your writing and specifically when you you mentioned earlier on this idea about or, and, or I, I picked up on this idea about um, about the that bear that soul bearing kind of comedy that wanting to see comedians actually reveal who they are. Yeah. You have produced a huge volume of material which has the most wonderful linguistic leaps and, and drawing comic parallels between subjects. I wrote down a few last time I saw you live. Something about uh, Trident, not wanting to cancel Trident because jobs are tied up in it. You can't not crack down on paedophiles because of the effect on the confectionery industry. Yeah. Do you know, you're, <laughs> which I've butchered and which I apologise. No, but, that's good. That's better than the way I did it. <laughs> But you, those kind of leaps of logic and finding equivalences within ideas, is that something that you feel you worked towards or is it something that came naturally or is it something at which you've improved? I think I'm much m more of a written comic than a performer comic. I mean, there are some comedians, it's all in the performance and I'm much more in the words. And I'm very careful. I mean, even if I'm speaking... To you now, I'm, I'm pausing to think about what I'm going to say, which I get from my dad, because my dad could never speak until the whole sentence was in his head, which meant it just take, it took ages to get anything out of him. So he, is he, he was, he was, you know, he left school at 15, but was very, very bright and was a scientist, was really clever. But he was very conscious of, about wanting to sound as clever as he was. And so he would always think, and he would be, he was a bit flowery. He would, you know, he, he was, he was, slightly pretentious and he, he 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 you know he'd grown up in quite a poor family and he wanted to be uh, as revered as were the people that he was circulating among but he um he would always sort of uh, take great great pains to to set out the exposition of that which he wished to express in the most apposite fashion and so i i think i've got a bit of that from him and i like i love the detail of words i mean I mean, what uh, I think um, Victoria Wood pointed out, the great thing about Alan Bennett, obviously he was a great influence on her, was specific, specificity, that word, specificity. That, you know, biscuits isn't as funny as bourbon creams, for example, you know, and, and these little things that young comedians say, oh, oh, I must remember that. But I mean, there are those things that are true, that, you know, that detail, and also not using the same word in the, set up as the punchline you, you've got to find a different word if the word in the punchline is truth in the setup is truthfulness in the punchline it's got to be honesty because you can't say truthfulness twice in the same i mean those things that you sort of learn and it and probably it's quite useful to do i mean I, we sneer at comedy courses but it's probably quite useful to have those things set out for you straight away so you don't make those mistakes um but yes i mean i very much like words but I think by not being much of a performer and getting used to that, I think I've become quite a good performer in, in just in terms of being at ease with, with myself and being able to, to just sometimes think, well, look, I'm not gonna, I'll try not to get in a flap about the joke. Because I see, I, I, I mean, when I do the news quiz on Radio 4, I, I, I do it without any notes and I don't, I've, I've thought about things, but I haven't formulated them that clearly. And a lot of people come and they're doing, they, they think they're on Mock the Week and they're, they're on, you know, they're, they think they're at a gig and they're doing Route One and, they're, and you think, you're talking in a weird voice. You're talking in a weird voice to people who go to sh sleep listening to the shipping forecast, <laughs> not knowing if they're going to wake up. 
you know, why are you talking in that weird voice? But they, that's their, that, that is what they think is their assertive comedy voice. Um, but I, I mean, performance is important, but it's just about, you know, it's just, it's just a human skill is how to present yourself in a way that is interesting and likable and compelling and people can bear to listen to for two hours. I don't, I don't like too much artifice. I think it's weird when somebody comes off stage and they're totally different from the person that they were on stage. There are people that do a character. I mean, you know, uh, Al Murray is a fantastic character comic. I mean, he is, and he does the crowd work. He's one of the few people. I mean, there are people who do crowd work who are brilliant at it, like Paddy Monaghan. and I think he's fantastic at crowd work. And Al Murray is an absolute genius at it. And he's, and it's a great character. And he's, and it's really, really funny, and really intelligent and thoughtful. And I mean, the danger is that people going along thinking we agree with this guy, but you know, people are always that's always going to happen. People thought that with, you know. Um, with Alf Garnet, you know, they thought, oh, good, we'll vote for that bloke. And they thought that with the clangers, good, well, we will go and live on the moon. <laughs> we will go and speak like Swanee Whistles and live on the moon. Good, thank God somebody's got the courage to do it. So um, you, can't, you can't, you can't, you know, constantly worry about the stupidity of the audience. But you, though you have got a responsibility to try not to. I'll tell you one thing, I did a gig at Jonglers once and I had a joke where I went on stage and, I, and the joke was going to be, I fucking hate black people. And the punchline was going to be, I fucking hate white people as well. Not very funny, but I thought it was quite good. Um, just a, you know, um, joke thing. And <laughs> I said, I fucking hate black people. And I got a massive cheer. And I thought, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody in the audience is on the same page. Yeah. So you'd have to th you do have to think about these things. I wanted to ask one more specific question about the writing, not just in terms the of writing. word choice, but also this, you're very good at taking ideas and finding an equivalent idea. Like another example I made a note of was democracy is like an emergency tracheotomy. Unless you're sure, don't do anything. And that is such, now that's not yeah. a case of, yeah, the, voting, word, the words voting, are very yeah. funny. The words are very funny, but it's not about word choice. It's about the choice of ideas. And as someone who has uh, produced a huge volume of stuff between the, the stuff that you do on News Quiz or the stuff that, you, that you've done in Jeremy Hardy Speaks the Nation or in your own stand-up tours, you've produced an enormous amount of those ideas of a consistent quality over a long period Thank of you. time. And I, I mean, that's something for me I find particularly difficult in my own writing. Whenever I get like a really good, oh, that's like that, I really make a meal of it and try and get every, get ring everything out of it because I'm like, finally, I've got one. Yeah, no, I, I, tend, I tend to leave it there. I mean, Mark Steele, who's a dear friend I spend a lot of time with, Mark will take an idea like that and he'll just do it for the next five, ten minutes. And he'll say, why don't you do more of that? And I'll say, no, I... I don't, I don't want to. It wouldn't be me. I, I don't feel like it. I mean, I did a thing, I did a joke about um, people say, oh, a lot of people join the army. They don't expect to get sent to war. And I said, well, they joined the wrong thing then, didn't they? If they'd, <laughs> if they'd you know, joined the scouts or the friends of the Royal Opera House, they could, they could have cause to complain. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> And Mark said, you should do a whole thing about the opera and all that. And I said, no, nah, it's done. It's just, I, I, it w I wouldn't feel, I you, mean, Mark would do it and it'd be brilliant, but it wouldn't feel true to me. You'd rather boil the idea down almost to a one liner, which says the entire. Yeah, I'm learning, I'm learning to get more out of things, partly because it fills up time, which is good. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and also, I did, you know, I'm running out of ideas and my life's coming to an end. So, um, <laughs> I mean, the great the thing that I one of the things that I like the most about what I do is I'm still learning how to do it, and I still consider it work in progress. And I can't give anybody any advice because I'm still figuring it out. And I think that's quite quite nice. I mean, I'm 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 at ease with myself in a way that a young comic maybe is, but not entirely. But I mean, um, I do think when you're younger, you just try too hard, you overthink everything, you over-explain everything. You have a rhythm which makes it so obvious where you're going that sometimes it's a bit, you know. I mean, I, I saw a comedian in French once, and I don't, I, I've, you know, I've got O level, but I can't, couldn't understand what he was saying. But I found myself laughing because of the rhythm of it, because, you know, people are quite Pavlovian, and I don't want to be like that. I don't want to sort of spoon feed the audience, say, here's where you laugh, you know, the way that politicians do with an audience where they speed up and let you know it's time to clap because they overemphasize everything and then pause and i think no i don't want to i don't want to be like that i don't want to be manipulative i don't i'll use the tricks that i've learned and the you know because 
you know, people say, I suppose the great thing about you is you, you have like one or two ideas and then the rest of it is entirely improvised, isn't it? And I go, yeah, and I think, you fucking idiot. <laughs> of, of course it isn't. You know, of course I've spent ages thinking about this and scribbling on bits of paper and, you know, writing things and thinking and putting, you know, but, but, but you know, you want to give people the impression that, that it, you, you want to be in the moment with them. I don't want to be somebody who's talking as though the audience isn't there, even though I'm not asking them questions and making jokes about their jobs. I want, I want to be in the room with them, you know. Are you uh, happy? Just not afterwards. <laughs> Are you happy? Well, profoundly happy. Um, sort of, yeah, I think so, yeah, in a way. I mean, I mean, it's about acceptance, isn't it? You reach a stage in life where you think, well, it's, this is it now. I mean, it's going to be like this. And that's quite a good place to be. I will not be massively famous, but neither, I hope, will I starve. And um, that's quite a good place to be, you know. And then, and then you can relax and then you can think, well, I can fiddle about, try some different things. I can, I can take some risks, you know, because I'm, I'm OK, you know. Um, and I don't, I don't want for much. I just want to sort of live out my years with dignity. <laughs> um, um, and I, want, I hope that I'll end up living somewhere where a nice man brings some owls round to show us once a month. <laughs> and no documentaries are made about the place. Um, but um, no, I'm, I am, yeah, I'm all right, actually. I'm, I, am, I am sort of quite happy, yeah, in a way. I mean, I think I'm happy in a good way, which is that I think that life is utterly awful. But I've, I've made peace with that, you know. Um, uh, yeah. I, I mean, people are probably thinking I'm being very disingenuous and setting up all sorts of smoke screens. But I don't know. Maybe they are, I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we, we should uh, leave it there. I'm being waved at from the back, okay. um, but not in a questioning kind of way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me? In, oh, one second. Uh, you can plug your tour, of course. Oh, You're still on tour. Uh, I'm on tour. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Hardy. <laughs> Oh, he's just, what a lovely man, what a funny, funny guy, such a great writer, such a great performer, just a real joy to speak to. And um, I think, you know, some people, when you've been into them for years and years and years, you meet them, you're slightly trepidatious, thinking, oh, God, I hope they're not a bastard. He is the opposite of a bastard, whatever that is. What a lovely guy. Thank you once again to Jeremy for coming along. And, of course, if you would like to be in the audience, one of these live ones, you've got one chance left this year at Soho Theatre. That's Joe Brand, interviewed on the 5th of June, sohotheatre.com, for your tickets. Now... Thank you, by the way. I've, got, I've fallen out of the habit of thanking Daryl, Daryl Smith, who edits this show for me, puts it together and uploads it. Uh, James Hingley, who's my web guy. Dan Melrose, you've not heard his name in a while. He wrote all the music and performed all the music and the stings and things. Um, come on, five years in, Goldsmith, rejig them. Nope, I like them. Um, and, uh, and all of the other people uh, on board who helped me with this. Now, here's a thing. I had this idea. I... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try improvising my way through this, and if you hear it in an unbroken fashion with no obvious edit points, then I did it successfully. But let's try and do this. I think a lot of you are funny, and I'm not addressing the professional comedians who listen to this show at this point. You're clearly funny. Um, you may not be to everyone's taste, but you're clearly funny. I'm not addressing even the newbie comedians. I'm, I may be addressing the wannabes, but you certainly can't have done a single gig to qualify for this, I'm going to do a little thing, right? I thought it would be fun because you've all got, we all have got ideas for jokes, little stories, ideas for one-liners, things we've observed, things we've noticed and gone, oh God, everyone does that. And I would like to give voice to those ideas and just try a bit of a dumb experiment. Um, what I'm planning to do at Edinburgh this year, 2017, at a Dayton venue, TBC, based on interest, it has to be said, um, and, and based on what I can get, I am going to perform an hour of your stuff that you send in that you think is funny, that it strikes you as funny, stories from your life, little twiddly jokes you've come up with, maybe even songs you sing. I can't sing, so bear that in mind. Um, and I'm going to ask you to submit them all at comedianscomedian.com forward slash experiment. Should probably have thought of something better, but why not? It is an experiment. And I'm going to attempt, I believe the world's first, entirely crowdsourced 
hour of comedy. Now, I've tried to Google this, and um, obviously what a lot of impro and improv, those are two separate strands, um, a lot of improvisers say that they improvise an hour of comedy show before your very eyes. They, um, or, you know, it's, I, obviously I'm not going to be improvising it, or I am, I'm going to be improvising around your script. So here's the thing, I'm not going to see it until... I mean, this may change, but I think an hour before I go on, uh, I'm going to get a friend, a friend of the show, uh, to uh, uh, collate all of your stuff. You submit it at comedianscomedian.com forward slash experiment, and then you uh, he reads it all, he sees it, I don't see it at any point, um, and then he's going to put it into some sort of order and give me either a script or some loose notes, and then I am going to receive that an hour before the show at a date and time, TBC, join the Edinburgh Festival, and I will then perform your comedy show it's a one-off it's called everyone's a comedian so if that strikes you as a fun idea listen if no one submits anything god knows what i'm going to do we won't do it um but i i feel like you're all very creative and i thought this would be a fun thing to do as i said i don't want to um I think on this occasion, I'm not going to hear from any comedians, professional or otherwise, um, because you've got, look, if you've done your first gig, you've taken the plunge, you've broken the seal, you've passed through the membrane, and you are less <laughs> deserving. That's <laughs> not quite right. But, you know, you've got an outlet, and this is for people who don't have an outlet. I will, of course, invite anyone who wants to come see. It'll be a public performance, but it won't be advertised anywhere. It's not in the Fringe Guide, so it'll just be for people who listen to the show, people on the mailing list, people who follow me on Twitter and are in the Facebook group. Um, and that's the idea. What do you think? Horrendous mistake? Who knows? The point I was making before is that it's hard to Google whether it's ever done before, because if you Google any version of crowdsourced, comedy, non-written, then you end up with lots of improvisers kind of loosely describing what they do, um, and it's it's not quite that. But I believe this is a, a, a first, dare I say a world first, and it could well be a world first car crash that then we realise why no one bothered doing it first in the world previously. But I think it'll be fun. You're going to have to tick a box when you submit your stuff, uh, along with your name and email address, um, swearing on your life that uh, this is your material and not something you've seen another comic do and sent in. That wouldn't be in the spirit of the thing, and I, I trust you not to do that. Um, and also waiving all rights to the gear, whilst on the understanding I'm not going to pinch the gear, I also don't really want, for the sake of this experiment, to have someone come to me in five years and go, oh, that bit's a bit similar to a thing. I'm going to keep all of it. It's all going through a, a third party, so there will be a store of everything. And um, and you can tick a box to say, OK, I don't think Stu's going to nick this, but uh, equally, I'm not going to start throwing wild <laughs> accusations around. Does that sound legal enough? Who knows? The point is, I think that you guys can write an hour of comedy and I can perform it and uh, you can come and see it. And either you can sit there giddily thinking, yes, my bit worked, or you can sit there thinking, God, he's mullered that. <laughs> what, a, what a waste of time. Or you can all just sneak away round about the 12th minute when it becomes clear that it is crashing and burning. That's the plan. Everyone's a comedian. This Edinburgh, time and place, TBC, comedianscomedian.com forward slash experiment. And that's all for now. I, I won't do a, a, a post amble, really. There's enough stuff going on in my life. I'm leaving for my stag do shortly. I haven't done enough work to enable me to have a couple of days off for the stag, but I will put everything to one side and just do it anyway, because you only have one. There's a joke there for anyone to insert a joke, but you do only have one, so I'm not going to do that. Um, the wedding is looking good. The boutros is in fine fettle. A little bit peaky at the minute just now. That's scary, isn't it? But um, it's having a poorly baby. Ugh. But he's he's on the mend and walking and all sorts of exciting things. Thank you to everyone that's been coming to the shows, that everyone, to everyone that's been getting in touch with me. I'm very pleased to be back. This is it. We're back now. More episodes weekly from now on. Um, and uh, it's been a good break. So thanks for bearing with me. Let's get stuck back in. Speak to you soon. Mm -hmm.